Ah, hey guys, Drunkens and Dragons here with another awesome episode about playing D&D like a big old badass. Well, today, here for a fireside chat, and I'm drinking beer out of a jar again. Mm. Ah, something about drinking out of a jar just makes you feel like you're drinking right out of the damn jar. Today's fireside chat is a topic that's near and dear to my heart and an area that I know dungeon masters all over the world are always talking about. And um, are they really getting anywhere talking about it? The topic is world building, 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 building. So you hear about it all the time and you watch videos about it all the time and it's always cool when you're talking about world building. So you probably heard your D&D buddies um, you know, hey, we're starting a new campaign and we're just building the world right now. It's really cool, man. And they're right. It's very cool. And then what do you do? Well, you generally put the map away and never talk about it again. Also, if your uh, group is playing like right out of the modules, like uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen or Rise of Tiamat or even Fandelver, you'll find that a ton of the material is dedicated to world building and option creation, which Frankly, do you really want to be in this situation of choosing all of these options about what you're going to do and if you have the money to fund the trip up the road and if you're going to get a urinary tract infection along the way and oh, there's this guy in the woods and what does he have to do with this other stuff that we're doing and oh, it's because I forgot to read you the description. No! Enough! I want to propose a different way of world building. It's what we're using in our PVE group right now and it's working out great. For starters, hang on to your hats. We did not make a world map. This is like the first cool thing that everybody playing D&D loves to do is like make the geography. There's a lake, there's a crazy mountain over here and like here's where the orcs killed all the elves a thousand years ago and all this crazy. You know, the Tolkien map is totally cool. I love Middle Earth as much as the next guy. Everybody loves the Middle Earth map. But making one does not ensure that you get a cool world for your campaign. I want to put an idea out there for you guys. I don't know if you can even see this. Boom! Check it out. I designed our game world from the side view. Freak show, right? Well, everybody when you're a little kid makes these like giant cave system drawings with all these little stick figures running around fighting each other and like the caves go deeper and deeper and deeper into the mountain and then you have to tape another piece of paper on there. And then you draw the little cave onto the next piece of paper. Before you know it, you got like 19 pieces of paper taped together and you're trying to tell your mom why this matters. Well anyways, that's awesome. And it leads you to a very focused view of what your world is. It is a sequence of encounters or rooms or chambers connected by blockades of some kind, usually doors in a simple case. Why is this better? Have you ever seen a group where uh, the DM basically gives you the lay of the land and then sits back? It's a really odd experience. Uh, all the players are trying to figure out if they're supposed to like take the initiative, just kill somebody at random, or just start running in a random direction. Um, and I could see with a really skilled DM and with the right group of players and the right campaign, I could see how it could be totally awesome. You know, you have real freedom, like in the Mario World map. You know, you can pick the little node you want to go to and so on and so forth. The DM is so prepared no matter what you do or where you go. There's a nice tight encounter ready for you. I imagine somewhere in the world that kind of D&D exists, but not here. Not on Drunkens and Dragons, no way, man. I got a day job. I got to think simple. So I know that on the first night, we're going to play through these two rooms. On the second night, we're going to play through these three rooms. We're working our way down the page. Uh, you'll notice too that I don't use grid paper. I don't use any of these awesome tools that are normally associated with D&D, I basically just scrawl my way through it. So like, I design rooms, you know, kind of like this. You know, exactly what are the keynotes of the room? What, what's the simple sequence? What's the timer? So I've got some other videos where I talk about room design and that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to talk about world building. What do you do? Well, do all the stuff that the guys in the other videos want you to do. They want you to have a compelling story. Get the uh, Elminster book for Forgotten Realms. Make sure that you're reading some good fantasy literature, you know, like the Drizzt stuff or um, 
Fofford and the Mouser or some Conan or something. You know, get a good handle on the overall fantasy vocabulary of what the tropes are. You know, you got to have Skull Mountain somewhere. Um, you know, you need the, the Chamber of Horrors. You know, you need a big bad guy with some kind of big overarching plan. You need somebody in the group to be shocked and surprised that they are part of an ancient prophecy. Like, you gotta have all this stuff. Okay, I'm gonna assume that since you're awesome at playing D&D, you've got all that covered. So, you've got a rich world. It's all the beers are named, all the villages are named, and there's five different languages and you've like got them all codified out and you can let your players over time learn the alphabet so they can decode carvings in dungeon doorways. Okay, great. You got that part nailed. You still don't have any answers about what your encounters are going to be and specifically like how they're going to play out. Let's face it, you guys. The game boils down to lots of combat encounters. Living inside initiative, People living and dying by one or two dice rolls, that's good game design. You want your encounters to push them to the absolute limit, but the difficulty is mostly in their mind, in that they're not seeing that there are easy way outs. E easy ways out. Ooh, must need another drink. That's good. Uh, so, you got all the esoteric stuff figured out, right? Because you're awesome. So how do you go about it? I would honestly suggest take a stab at making one encounter and stop. Get your players together, figure out the characters and who do 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 what the backstory. Uh, there is no backstory, honestly. You just, just plunge them in there. Say you're a group of adventurers. The old days of watching a group of players try to overcome their diametric alignments to me are over. I have had enough of having a chaotic evil character amidst a bunch of goody two-shoes and they try to cope. And I can speak from experience on this. I was that guy. I was a goblin. Chaotic evil pyromaniac. Hanging out with a paladin. And granted there were some really good shenanigans, but most of the time the role playing is a sham. Just let your adventurers be adventurers. They're, they're together. Okay, boom. You're on a road and you come around a bend and there's something strange up ahead. Bang, you're good. Go into initiative time, let people start checking. Before you know it, the goblins are pouring out of the woods. Now this is one great thing about Fandelver, you have that opening encounter. Now the problem with the opening encounter in Fandelver with the, with the goblins is A, space is not well controlled. You can run off into the woods, you can go up, down, and sideways. There's no control on space. So if the group really just wants to scatter, which would be probably the smart thing to do, they can, and it ruins the timing. Number two, there is no time limit, so they can kind of, you know, shuck and jive and flee, and it just doesn't have that sense. This is why starting your players as prisoners can always be really awesome. Right away, they have a closed system, a fixed number of options, and they start focusing on the dice and on each other. But give your players a controlled amount of space, watch the battle unfold, then when the session's over, great time to start thinking a little more about your world. Instead of doing all this preparatory work and the, uh, what's it called, the B-Duff method? Big design up front. Don't do that. Just iterate on what the tone is that your players are creating. Spin on little bits of story that maybe they're figuring out as they're either rolling or playing their characters. Spin on weird relationships that evolve while they're fighting their opening sets of goblins. Don't be too quick to just let go of goblins. You can fight goblins for 10 levels and it's still interesting. It's all how you present the challenge. You can have more goblins, you can have them up on a high ground, you can have archers backing the goblins up. But it isn't just like, okay, well the first night of gameplay is over so we're gonna put away the goblins and now we're gonna fight the holders. It just doesn't work that way. Take your time. Go play Dragon Quest. You gotta fight those oozes or whatever. For what, 20 levels? You're just killing oozes? And then when you see something like a skeleton, it's freaking awesome. Apply those techniques. When you see, oh man, a skeleton really scares my people, think about how that you know, is included in your world. Maybe there's a good horror element you can bring into your world because your characters are kind of fun and the players kind of get afraid and so you can play on it. Maybe you have characters who are just balls out attacking all the time. So design your world to be a challenge for them. It's a world at war. A lot of other people are like that. I guess what I'm saying is don't over-design your world. Think of it from the side view. 
Don't neglect how great the Underdark can be. It's an endless dungeon. And there are towns in it and everything. It's, it's cool, but it's a very controlled space. And then if you finally bring your characters out into the sunlight, they're just going to be filled with joy. Um, and then, I guess finally, do your world building from your players. Go ahead and do an opening night that's pretty simple. See what happens. Out of their knee. How, what they do. Out of what they do, create your world that way. Be a cool DM. Being a cool DM is a big part of everybody having fun, and that is what d and is all about, little chitlins. So, this is Hankering for now, signing off. So go do your world building, and play Super Metroid if you get confused, and everything will become clear. Strength, honor, and beer.